At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Welcome to Studio Sacramento. Today's episode was developed in partnership with our local chapter of the American Leadership Forum. Since the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut last year, it seems every day there's another incident involving gun violence in the news. Whether the frequency of gun-related deaths is accelerating or merely that recent events have more sensitized us, many of us are having conversations about guns, gun control, violence in our communities, and what each of us as individuals should be doing about it. This subject can be very personal, and today we're going to take a different approach. Instead of bringing in the usual experts on gun violence, we are having a conversation with two citizens active in the civic betterment of our region who will share their perspectives and speak their minds as individuals about the issue of gun violence. Joining us today are nonprofit consultant Nancy Brodovsky and communications expert Jean Endicott. Nancy, Jean, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So let's start here. It seems like that there is something different going on in our society. Do, is there a greater prevalence of gun violence or is that just our imagination because we're all more sensitized to it at this moment? What do you think? I think there's been a problem with gun violence for a long time. Uh, and I also believe that there is more attention to the issue now based on some of these horrific events that we've seen recently in Aurora, Portland, obviously Newtown. Um, but the problem is not a new problem. It's a problem that's been around in this country for a long time. Uh, and I'm pleased that against the backdrop of those tragedies, that there is increasing attention to the issue and thought being given to the reasonable steps that can be taken to keep more of these types of things from happening in the future. Well, you know, when you talk about reasonable steps and, and we discuss what's happened thus far and, and the state of the debate, is there a, a consensus in this country, though, in terms of what might be reasonable? I think it's changing. Really? Um, if you looked at the polls, all of a sudden the numbers who would even consider uh, looking at gun legislation is in hot, way beyond 60 percent, even into 70 percent. So when you start to get that kind of consensus, it can change. But I think there's violence that's just not being looked at. You look at Trenton, you look in Chicago, it's like not here, so we're not looking at it. It took the incident with little children first graders, second graders, when those little children were gunned down, that stopped everybody, and then I think everyone had to t take, a, take a breath. Why do you think that is, Nancy? Because you send your children to school, you're thinking you say goodbye, give a kiss, you say goodbye, and you expect them to come home. And that's the safe place. Uh, and when that got stopped, it stopped, I think it, it, it literally stopped everyone. And it made people look at their opinions and see, am I on the right track? You know, I, I will tell you, it made me hug my own children a little bit tighter uh, that day and the, in the days following. Absolutely. I, I, in, back to your question about is there a consensus, I think it's, it's very clear there is a consensus that there are some steps that can be taken and should be taken as soon as possible. And frankly, I get frustrated um, with the lack of quick progress toward, you know, the steps that can be, uh, I believe, achieved in even in a politically safe way by those on, you know, both sides of the aisle or those on different sides of the issue. The statistics Nancy alluded to are correct that, uh, for example, if you take the issue of universal background checks, which is an issue getting a lot of attention right now and seems to have political traction, um, NRA members themselves support that idea 
at a rate of about 74 percent. The public in general, it's closer to 90 percent. There aren't a whole lot of issues across the country you can talk about that have that level of support. And so I look at that and I say, why can't we get it done right away? I think eventually we will get there on, and, and reasonably soon, but it's not as fast as I would like it to you, be. You work in communications and it, it is puzzling in that there was a, a poll done by the New York Times and CBS and it says exactly what both of you just stated. Um, according to this poll that was done uh, recently, the ban on semi-automatic weapons, low majority, 53 to 44, favor a ban. High capacity magazines, 63 to 34. Background checks, 92, what you just said, 92 to 7, and national database, 78 to 20. Now, if there is that level of support, and you just take the ones that are over 60 percent, but you know, all of the predictions say that nothing's going to happen. What, what, what's coming up the works? Here's where I'm coming from on that point. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reflected where I'm, how I evolved. So Newton, Newtown happens. I'm a news nut and I'm listening to TV news. I gravitate to it. And I think it, what struck me first was people's attitudes started changing. People who were very conservative, who had guns, et cetera, and they were changing some of their views. And one of the co uh, columnists, um, actually Mike Barnacle, made the statement, he, he says, I think we're looking at it wrong. We should call it gun sense, not gun control. And that to me was a light bulb went off. Because when you call it gun control, immediately different people kind of line up whatever their opinion is. And it, it's, in the end, it's always about money. So will I get funded? Will I get reelected? And it's always, and really, that's one of the big issues. I think why they're still holding up and still massaging some of their votes. Can I get you on this or not? Because at the end of days, will I have the money? And the NRA has been very strong. And, and they're a fearing of that. Now you get Michael Bloomberg and his group who said, don't worry, we'll fund you the other way. So money is starting, in my mind, to be evened out and won't be a factor. But when you take the word, to me, gun control is, it sends off light bulbs to people right, and they right. feel they have to kind of line up. If you call it gun sense, doesn't that change the conversation to say what makes sense? And so I start, that to me said, well, I'm looking let me at the look communications at expert. <laughs> and I, maybe you'll like this. So I said to myself, oh, well, maybe I need to look inward. What's my opinion? How he, these people are changing, what am I doing? And, and how I are you changing? Agree. How are you changing? What caused you to start evolving your point of view? I grew up in Denver and I, and I was very, it was very tragic to me what happened in Colorado. First there's Columbine and now Aurora and I had just been there. Two weeks before, I'm driving from my sister's uh, son's wedding and we, exactly two weeks to the day I drive by that theater and then we go to dinner and we're out in Littleton right next to Columbine so now I look back and it's like this is not what you want to think about your state or your city I was anti-guns we don't need them there's too many our culture is so prolific and violence we kind of gravitate to ooh, there's another movie we gotta go run and see and I thought, well, frankly, statistics will say we have 50% of all the guns in the world. Do we really need them? No. But I then, once New Newtown happened, I started listening to other people talk about the culture of being able to go out hunting with their grand it's generational with their grandparents and their kids and the joy of it or going target practice and the excitement of it and also the ability to defend your home, yourself. In and I thought, I think I need to change. This isn't what I think. It's not what I'm used to or relate to, but under the law, they're entitled to it. No one's gonna come take their guns. They have a responsibility to make sure they're locked and they're safe in their own home so they don't get stolen. But I had to, they're, they're we need, I guess if that's what people wanna do and they're entitled to it, so be it. Then let's do gun sense, but to make sure that we try and avoid, and it's a complicated issue. So in other words, you're not really for just banning guns outright or no. necessarily on board with no, banning work. all different forms of hunting, 
semi-automatic or any of that other stuff? When it comes, my worry is, and I know we get trouble, we get all hung up, you the communications expert, on how you define what's an assault weapon. What my concern is, when you have gun power that rivals the police or military, you as a citizen, that makes no sense to me. That to me is a dividing line. Hmm. Why should you have that kind of equipment at home? Well, well, one thing that I just point out is this, is that we've had a couple of police chiefs on the show, and one thing that they point out about gun control, gun control or gun sense, as Nancy states it, is that if you live in a fairly dangerous neighborhood, um, protection becomes a lot more dear. And one thing which is also an issue is sometimes uh, the police presence is not by itself able to control uh, violence and, and keep people safe. So how is it that we might wrestle with this, Gene? Well, first off, just back real quick to the issue we were just, just discussing in terms of what's gumming things up. I think, you know, like a lot of issues, um, you know, politics is very important in this. And um, I don't really care so much what it's called, uh, whether it's gun control or gun sense, what I would like to see is more focus on what it appears we can agree on, things like universal background checks, for example, which are at the top of the list you were just talking about, and make sure that policymakers in Washington, which is where I would like to see most of the action when it comes to gun policy, by the way, so there's consistency across the country, are aware that there are different perspectives on these issues than what they would typically have heard, especially in recent years, from organizations like the NRA, which are generally going to be opposed to any of the proposals that you were just mentioning. I think that's a pretty fair statement. Um, and so that's the value. If there is any silver lining at all, I'm not trying to suggest that there is, but against uh, related to these incidents is that it's heightened attention and I think has provided a more balanced perspective for policymakers who ultimately will need to make that well, decision. Le but, but let me come to the okay. issue you just asked about in terms of neighborhoods and guns for protection and all of that. Um, I understand that, you know, that sort of emotional feeling that um, you're responsible for protecting yourself and your family and all of that. But sadly, and, and I don't know the exact st statistics offhand, but it's been made very clear for a long time that when there are lots of guns around, they're much more likely to be used in the wrong way than the right way. And all I have to do is look at the situation in South Africa to understand that. I mean, that's a perfect example of what happens when you got guns around and with people who maybe aren't, aren't trained appropriately in how to use them, are paranoid. Uh, and, and, and justifiably, in many cases, concerned about their safety. So I don't view that having guns in the home and readily available as a solution to the kind of larger issue you raise that is important in some communities that have high crime rates. But understand it from the NRA's perspective. What the NRA, if they were sitting here, and we've invited representatives from the pro-gun interests on the show many times and we've never been able to get someone to show up but if they were here what they would say is that the second amendment and the right to carry arms is the bulwark of ensuring that our government really never can uh, just have their way with the citizenry but but uh, I don't think there's anything we're talking about right here that um, is inconsistent with the Second Amendment. Uh, we already uh, say that criminals and the mentally ill aren't allowed to have guns. That's been ruled consistent with the Second Amendment. But it Amendment. doesn't You're work. You're not allowed to have certain weapons. But in Newtown's case, that was a, a situation where it is that that young man, obviously mentally ill, did get a hold of guns. And so, uh, that actually is is one of the issues that the NRA puts forward is saying you're focusing on the wrong thing, which is don't focus on taking away everybody's guns. Focus on providing 
more access to services for the mentally but ill. But to me, it's not an either or. Yeah, can't we do it's more than either or. one I time? Mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I agree completely with the sentiment that we need better services for those who have um, emotional problems. Uh, I mean, that, that in and of itself is a very, very important issue. There's no doubt about it. My argument is, though, why, why would we not consider reasonable steps like background checks they're going to make it more difficult, not impossible. I'm not trying to make that argument. Make it more difficult for people who have no business getting access to those kinds of weapons to have them. And I mean, you could go down incident by incident and point to all kinds of different circumstances around different situations. But to me, if there are things you can do that are going to make it more difficult for guns to be used in the wrong way against innocent victims, why would we not be open to those kinds of solutions? Well, ahead, there's Nancy. two things that I think that has to be addressed in this. When you're talking about, the, we talked about mental illness, I found it fascinating that of all the gun deaths, three out of five are related to suicide. So right away, we're not even talking about that issue enough, and that does relate to mental illness. And it relates to people who can become despair at a time and, it all, and then they have their gun in their home. In many ways, it's like friends don't let friends who are depressed have guns at that moment in their home. It's not safe. And so we'd have to really look at that, which is that every issue we ever deal with is always so complicated. So mental illness, we're closing clinics and we don't let, because of insurance, let people even go get mental health. And yet we have these issues. So that is something that could feed into this that could help that scenario. The second aspect is related to guns in the secondary market. The, the loopholes, the being able to buy, you've seen these on TV shows where people are buying guns. They even say, they elude that they're criminals and they sell them out of their cars or they sell them at gun shows or they sell them off the store or they, or they sell it between each other, but I don't have to record it. Well, if, I buy, if you buy my car, you have to have a title. And it's that, again, I think For, gun sense. Forty percent, forty percent of gun sales elude background checks. 6.6 6 million guns a year change hands outside of any kind of a background check process. Okay, but, but wait a minute, okay? I, I want to share with you all, former gang leader from Stockton sat in that chair several months ago, and he tells me, be, uh, talking about the violence in Stockton, that he can buy a gun on the street right now for 50 bucks, okay? And people that are on the pro-gun side of the equation or status quo, we'll say, or all guns all the time, would say that the three of us at this table, we would submit to the gra background checks, we'd, we'd exercise gun sense, we'd do the right thing, but in fact, where the danger comes from, and notwithstanding the people with mental illness that you just spoke about, are the folks who can buy on this secondary market that Nancy just described for 25 to 50 bucks at a time. And that nothing we're talking about is gonna get at that issue. How do, how do we deal with that? There's no doubt that um, there are so many guns around that you're, you're not gonna come up with any solution that will um, remove them in all instances from people who shouldn't have them. That's not the argument that I, I would certainly be trying to make. But I do think that the kinds of proposals we've discussed can at least move you in a direction where you have some chance of stemming the flow of guns from people who legally ought to be allowed to have them into the hands of those who shouldn't have them. So to me, I, I get frustrated with the argument that says, well, th this problem is so significant that in effect, we're never gonna be doing, able to do anything about it, so let's do nothing. I don't buy that. I think that there are reasonable steps you can take to at least start to get at the issue you're describing. I don't make the argument that the kinds of proposals we're talking about, universal background checks or limits on ammunition magazines or anything like that will eliminate all gun deaths or eliminate all crime, but I do think there's a likelihood that it would have some kind of impact and keep at least some innocent people from being killed. 32 people in this country are killed every day by guns. That doesn't even count the uh, suicide. If you count suicides, it's about 90. 
a day, every single day. That's crazy. How do we allow that to happen? More than the, more than the people killed in Newtown are killed every single day wow. in this country. Really? 32 people a day. Okay, so one place to look also is, mm -hmm. let's go back to um, the ATF. Did they, did they ever get ahead? No, so for last, they have never, uh, the Senate or whoever has approved it, so you don't even have someone running that department. And I believe that I was hearing that they have not really hired more people to work there. There's no one running the Bureau of they're, Alcohol? They've never been approved. He has, has a been job. For, there hasn't been for quite a while. No, now. it's been yeah. a, quite a while. And I also understand they haven't really hired any. They're, they, they could, they're still with the same amount of people at the ATF several years ago as there are now. Give some muscle and some teeth to the organization. And I would love someone to investigate who helped write all the background to relate to what the ATF can and can't do. And I think some, uh, the organization that uh, is the NRA was very instrumental in helping them write well, it. And I'm not sure that's who you want having Well, write. let me give you guys uh, just a few statistics here because I thought this was interesting. On civilian gun ownership, in America there are 270 million guns supposedly. Now there's really poor data Right. on gun statistics and violence statistics in this country related to gun violence overall. Uh, New England Journal of Medicine did a report uh, a while back and they were citing studies that were 15 years old at the time. So it shows that there well, is a- they weren't allowed to. That was part of it. They took it away. They said you're not allowed to anything gun related. Health wise, we're not allowed to investigate. I see, I see. That's why. So we have 270 guns, 270 million guns uh, in the country, or 89 per 100 people. China, as a comparator, has 40 million guns, or five per 100 people. India, 46 per 100 people, or 46 million, or four per 100 people. The number of guns we do have is pretty astounding. Uh, we are well armed in this country. And they're getting concentrated with fewer people also. Yes. That's another trend. Right. And, and so I want to come back, you know, to sort of the gun culture, but also popular culture. Because another thing that the NRA has said is, hey, don't lay it on gun owners. Responsible gun owners, they are being responsible. It's other, uh, other issues in society. For instance, you mentioned running out to seeing the latest movie, and I assume you were alluding to movies with a lot of gunplay and violence and things like that. Video games, music, movies. There was a bit of a there was a bit of a of a stir over the responsibility that Hollywood and our popular culture has on promoting uh, an a insensitivity to gun violence. Let's let's talk about that for a second. What are your perspectives on that? I th I, I could see a correlation, but I uh, in in. Just the you know desensitization, the desensitization, uh, sorry, uh, if you will, that um, comes along with that. Um, so I, I could see that that is potentially a factor, but again, I just come back to the more tangible, what I consider to be direct steps that could be taken to ev you know e even if those other societal influences are driving somebody toward violence. So you're going to let make Hollywood off the hook. I, 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 again, I, I accept the fact that there is some impact there. I said that right, right out the chute. But what I also know is that when it comes to the kinds of proposals we're discussing, that if you look state by state across the country, the states with the lower levels of gun violence tend to have the um, more comprehensive gun control, if you will, gun sense, um, uh, policies in place, the states with the higher levels of gun violence tend to have the lower levels of gun control, gun sense policies in place. No, so I, th I don't think there's any one factor you can point to that says that makes a problem or that reduces a problem. I don't think it's as simple as that. Right. And you come to this, you've had your own personal experience with gun violence, correct? Right. Not, not a family member, but a very, very good friend. I, I first 
really started to get interested in these issues and started to educate myself about the issues almost exactly 32 years ago, as a matter of fact. Um, March uh, 1981, when a uh, high school buddy and his girlfriend were shot. Uh, she did not survive, he did. Um, and, and I just decided at that point that, you know, I needed to, at minimum, be more educated about the issue and the impact that guns were having in our society. By the way, just to finish the story, um, I found out about him on March 30th. Uh, I was living at home from college uh, and on spring break at the time down in the Bay Area. Um, my dad said, why don't you come over and have lunch with me? You know, because he knew I was upset and everything. So I went over, took Bart over to San Francisco to have lunch with my dad, walk into his office and he says, Reagan just got shot. And I thought the world was falling apart. Oh. Oh. I, thought, I thought we were all going to be the victims of gun crimes. You know, it, it just seemed like everything was sort of falling in on me at that moment. I mean, obviously that wasn't the case, but that's what it felt like. And, and, and I just decided at that point in time, again, that I, at minimum I needed to be more educated about the issues and given the opportunity to try to do something about it. All right. All right. And in our final seconds, I just wanted to ask, and each one of you has about five seconds to respond. In the next year, what's one thing that you think that could happen that could make a difference? Either something we've discussed already or something new. You got five seconds. I'm the optimist. I do see Congress coming together in a bipartisan way and, and passing gun sense. All right. I think we're going to see a universal background check program to close the, the loophole that allows 40% of gun sales to escape that process. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned and we'll see what happens. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. That's our show. Thanks to the American Leadership Forum and thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in.